testimony to God's faithfulness to his mission. Well, good morning, Aletheia Church. Uh, excited that we are able to gather together and worship this morning. Hope that you guys that are gathered in gospel communities are enjoying your time together and yet staying safe. And for those of you at home, either with your families or roommates or on your own, good morning. We love and miss you guys as well. Uh, excited for next week, June 7th, uh, when we will gather together again uh, to worship together as the body of Christ in our back parking lot starting at 8.15 a.m. And I will give you some more uh, specifics about that uh, later on in our video service this morning. Uh, if you have a Bible uh, you can, or your scripture journal, you can go ahead and open that up to Acts chapter 17. That is where we are going to be this morning as we go through uh, the entire chapter uh, this morning. Uh, I want to start out this morning by sharing with you a, a story or a series of stories that I think might help us tie into this idea of what we're going to see in Acts chapter 17 uh, this morning. Uh, so I used to work in banking before I became a full-time pastor here at Aletheia Church. And I worked in a number of different areas. I worked as a frontline teller. Uh, I did back office support work at times. Uh, I worked in human resources and was also in middle management there as well. And one of the things I enjoyed about my job uh, was my coworkers. Uh, oftentimes I found that the workplace uh, really can become almost like family or, or many families. And, and there's something really just beautiful about that, about the way uh, a, a healthy work environment can turn into these little pockets of, of family. Uh, and I, I just really enjoyed that in, in my time in the banking world, even if I didn't enjoy some of uh, the other aspects of the job at times. Uh, and now, being that I was a follower of Jesus uh, in these uh, different uh, work settings, uh, and I would often talk about that and how God was working in my life in various stages. I kind of became in most of my offices the go-to guy for questions about the Bible or questions about what Christians believe uh, in certain situations. Uh, and let me share some of those examples with you. Uh, back in 2008, I was working part-time on weekends and during the summer at a bank back home in my hometown. And one of my coworkers and I, she and I had grown close over time, and she confided in me that she had had an abortion uh, earlier that year. And I remember her asking me with tears in her eyes, do you hate me now that you know that about me? Does God hate me because I did that? In 2010, there was a major earthquake that rocked Haiti. And I remember shortly after the earthquake, Pat Robertson, a televangelist, uh, was shown on TV claiming that Haiti had experienced the earthquake as punishment for certain sins that they had committed. The next day, one of my coworkers came up to me and said, Kevin, does the Bible really say that God is punishing all of the Haitians because of their sins over the last couple hundred years? In 2012, when I was working here in Gainesville at a local bank, I'll never forget working one Saturday morning with a coworker, and out of the blue, she asked me this question. Kevin, why did God murder his own son? That seems wicked to me. Why would Christians celebrate that? I have intentionally not shared my responses to those questions. Because I want to ask you this. How would you respond to those questions? If someone in your life came up to you and asked you the types of questions that I would ask, would you know what to say? Today in Acts chapter 17, we're going to see a beautiful example of the Apostle Paul using what we would define as apologetics. Apologetics is the discipline of defending doctrines and beliefs. And I believe here in Acts chapter 17, Paul actually gives us a roadmap on how we can learn and be equipped and empowered to do this. So let me quick, quickly catch you up to speed on what we see in the first half of Acts chapter 17. Uh, in verses 1 through 9, Paul and Silas are in Thessalonica, and the church begins to grow there through their outreach. But as the church grows, the Jews become jealous. 
Uh, the Jews used local Roman officials to persecute Paul and Silas, and this forces Paul and Silas to flee the city. And once the Jews realize that Paul and Silas have fleed, instead they go after one of the church leaders in that, in that city by the name of Jason. And they take him and they pull him out in front of the, the leaders and Jason ends up bribing them to get them to stop persecuting him. When we move on to verses 10 through 15, Paul and Silas are in another area called Berea. And as they are in Berea, they begin worshiping in the synagogue and witnessing there as well. And the Jews in Berea, it says, were willing to listen and be taught about Jesus. Jews from Thessalonica, though, eventually get wind that Paul and Silas are in Berea again. And so they show up there and cause an uproar yet again, forcing Paul to have to leave and flee to Athens. And that is where our text picks up today, starting in verse 16. And what I plan to do this morning is I'm going to slowly kind of work through the narrative of what is going on in verses 16 uh, through about verse 30, 31. And I'm going to point out uh, a few observations that I have in the text this morning. But then once we finish kind of working our way through it, I'm going to go back and I'm going to give you what I see as uh, the major uh, talking points that Paul gives us on how we can equip ourselves and be empowered to defend the faith. So let's start at verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city was full of idols. And so Athens was a, a city in Greece. If you've studied uh, ancient world history at all, you're probably familiar with it. But it was by this point in time in Roman life and culture, still a major intellectual hub, even though it was underneath Roman control and was also a city of great economic progress. Uh, and so here you have this city that's full of economic progress, wealthy, and also intellectual thought. And it's not dissimilar uh, to a city like the one we live here in Gainesville, where uh, the, the primary commodity here is education. Most people come here to receive an education and grow in their particular discipline or field. And I want you to notice what is true about Paul in this passage. It says, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. Tuck, tuck that line away in the back of your mind because we're going to come back to that later on. But just notice Paul's gen, general response to the city of Athens as he moves into it. Then he says this in verse 17. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. So the first thing Paul often did anytime he went into a new city is he would go to the synagogue first to reason and share the gospel with them. This was Paul's ministry strategy over and over, time and time again, as you move through the second half of the book of Acts. But it says afterwards, he also went into the marketplace. And markets were not just uh, malls or shopping centers the way they might be in the United States. Uh, but there was a lot going on in marketplaces uh, during this time period. Uh, they were cultural centers as well as economic centers. And so there would have been a number of different things going on there and it had been a great place for Paul to begin open air preaching or engaging in conversations with people that might be willing. So then this happens starting in verse 18. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And so there's kind of two separate things in this verse that I want to break down and show you guys. The first one is these two different groups of people that Luke mentions in the narrative. Those are the Epicureans and the Stoics. And what we need to know about them is that they were actually in opposition to one another. The same way in the gospel narratives that we see the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming together to question Jesus, in most of everyday life, Pharisees and Sadducees were actually intellectual and uh religious enemies of each other. They did not agree with one another on many things. Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were much the same way. They did not have a whole lot in common. Uh, Epicureans were devoted to sensual enjoyment and they believed that God or gods were not interested in what was going on here. And so their basic model, uh, motto on life was you only live once. You can, you can just 
eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, was kind of their approach to life. Now the Stoics, however, and you've probably heard that term used as an adjective to describe somebody. You might say like, oh, he's very Stoic. And what the Stoics were known for was that they pursued self-mastery, perseverance, and in that they sought wisdom. And they believed that their their self-mastery and perseverance would allow them to lead a better life here and make a bigger impact on the culture that they lived in. And so here you have Epicureans who are saying, hey, eat, drink, be merry, do whatever you want. And you have the Stoics on the other side would be like, Uh, No, you absolutely should not do that. You should uh, be involved with uh, self-mastery. You should be taking care of yourself and you should be looking ways to make the world around you a better place. And you should do do so with an air of responsibility around you. And so they are coming together in this marketplace as Paul is teaching of the resurrection and look at their response to Paul's teaching in the market. They use a term for him called babbler, and that is a derogatory term, especially in that time period. What it meant is that it describes someone who would talk and ramble about ideas or philosophies that they really didn't understand themselves. And so by them calling Paul a babbler, they're basically saying, this guy's over here running his mouth and he has no clue what he's talking about. Now, They also say he appears to be a preacher of foreign divinities. So either way, right, there is not a positive impression of Paul amongst the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. And I think we should take note of this as Paul is presenting the gospel and going into this new city with hopes of planting a church here that's going to explode and, and be a hub for the gospel in other areas of the Greek world we may not be treated as intellectual giants and being intellectually intelligent when sharing the gospel. If anyone who, that we see throughout the New Testament could be described as being intellectually uh, intelligent and having well-reasoned, sound, logical arguments, Paul would be one of those guys. And yet we see amongst the popular philosophers and thinkers of his day, he's being called a babbler and someone who peddles foreign divinities. So then moving into verse 19, look at what happens next. And they took him, that's Paul, and brought him to the Areopagus saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. And so the, the philosophers and the, and the crowd that's gathered around Paul at this point invites him to share uh, what he is preaching about more fully. And I think something that's important to understand is that uh, Greeks and Romans were a lot like American culture in that it was incredibly pluralistic. Yes, Greek and Roman mythology had its place in the grand cultural scheme of Rome, but there were a lot of competing philosophies and worldviews in this culture. And what this led to in society for them, for the most part, was a very universalistic approach to philosophies and worldviews. And so likely what they wanted to do was to bring Paul up to the Areopagus and they were going to basically put him on trial because they wanted to find out whether his God was a God worthy of being enshrined on the Acropolis, which was a major mount in Athens where multiple temples to various gods were placed. And what I want you to see is not so much the fact that Luke puts a little jab at the Athenians by saying all they did was waste all their time hearing new ideas all the time, which I would submit to you is something that might even be said of many, many cultures today, maybe primarily university cultures, right? But hearing new ideas over and over again without making any real response to those truth claims. But what I really want you to notice is as they are getting ready to bring Paul before this tribunal and allow him to explain the gospel, Paul is ready. 
Paul is going to be ready to make a defense for Christianity, the God of the Bible, and the gospel. And this is the call of all followers of Jesus. Peter said so in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. He says this, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. And so Paul is prepared to give this defense as the Epicureans and the Stoics take him up to the Areopagus. And then in verse 22, we see Paul is going to begin to address them. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this, with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. And so I love that, right? Paul points out, hey, I noticed walking through, you know, your, your different temples and shrines, you have this one altar that is to an unknown God. Isn't that just fascinating? They, they were uh, believers of their own worldviews and philosophies. They believed they were intellectual giants. They loved hearing new ideas. They loved hearing about new gods. And yet they had in the back of their minds an altar that said, hey, in case we missed one, we, wanna, we don't want to leave you. We don't want to leave that God out. So we're just going to build this altar to him, even though we have no idea who that God may be. Then in verse 24, Paul says this, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And so we see as he gets to, to, to verse 24, Paul does two things. First, he answers this question for them. Who is the unknown God? Paul goes, I know who he is. Let me tell you about him. And then he's going to start to point out logical inconsistencies with their current belief system. He's going to say, hey, look, God made the universe. This unknown God that you're referring to on the altar here, this God made the universe, and I know him. He's the God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And why would he, as creator, need a temple? Why would he, the creator of the universe, need to be crafted by human hands? Why would he, the transcendent, all, all-knowing, always-existing God of the universe, subject himself to being in a statue. Then he moves on to say, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far off from each one of us. So then he, he moves from saying, I know the God you're talking about. Your views of God and worldview do not line up with the reality of the world around us and do not line up with the reality of the God of the Bible. And then he makes an appeal to them in verses 26 through 27 on the nature of God. And he says, look, first of all, you need to understand this. God is for all people. He is not tribal. Just because the God of the Bible revealed himself to the people of Israel does not mean he is just for them. He is for all people. And the second thing you need to know is this, God is worthy of our pursuit over any other worldview or philosophy. And this is important to understand because Romans and Greeks were under the impression that gods were only worth pursuing or appeasing in order to get something in return. If you were a sailor, you would often worship the god of Poseidon because you wanted the god of the sea to uh, grant you safe passage in your business and with your livelihood as you sailed along the sea. 
right? If you were interested in other things, you might worship another God so that that God might favor you in some way, shape, or form. But this is how the gods of the Greek and Roman world worked. And really, in reality, a lot of other pantheistic religions work that way. Paul says, though, hey, God is greater than these false Greek gods that you have created these statutes to because he is God. He is not subjected to human hands. He's not over just one certain area of creation. He is over all creation and we pursue him and we love him and we worship him, not because we get something from him, but because he actually is God. And if he is God, he's worthy of our worship and our pursuit and our attention. He's making a philosophical argument to them saying, hey, if your God is only good if he can give you something, he's not really a God and he's not really worthy of your attention. Let me tell you about this unknown God who actually is. And then look at what he says in verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. He quotes two separate Greek writers here to reveal a truth about the nature and character of God. He declares to them this, God is glorious yet knowable. And he quotes Epimenides when he he says this, in him we live and move and have our being. He's saying, hey, we only exist because of God. Even your own poet and philosopher Epimenides knew this. And then he's going to quote another poem by Eratus in saying, for we are indeed his offspring. Meaning we are God's offspring and we seek to honor him and know him because of that. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, He has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. (laughs) Look what he says there as he wraps up this defense of the gospel to them. If God is good, as your philosophers have said, it is foolish to pursue these statues and idols that you have made out of gold and clay and whatever else you may have constructed them out of. And then he goes on to say to them, the time of ignorance about the unknown God has come to an end because God has sent me here to tell you about him. God has sent me to tell you who he truly is. And we ask that you repent from following these worldviews and these gods and instead turn to the living God, that you would turn instead to the man that he has sent, Jesus who he gives ultimate authority to, to rule and reign in righteousness. And you can know that God has sent this person because we testify to the truth of his resurrection from the dead. Isn't that beautiful? We see just this beautiful defense of what God has done for us in Christ, given to the Greeks here in Acts chapter 17. And I believe that we see a four-part pattern from Paul here when presenting and persuading the gospel to others that we can learn from. And I'm calling it Paul's methodology methodology of apologetics. And so here are the four kind of keys that I think we see Paul use and that we can in turn try to incorporate into our own ability to give a defense of our faith. If you're not a Christian this morning, let me just show you this. Christianity is true and defensible. And Paul is going to lay out to us 
some very key components to being able to give a defense of Christianity. The first one is be prepared by knowing our context. I'll go into depth on these more in just a moment. The second one is he finds places of common ground with his audience. The third thing he does is he exposes the deficiencies of false worldviews and philosophies. Then the fourth thing he does is he declares the greatness of God over all things. So let's break these down a little bit and kind of work through how we can have a working uh, process and methodology and apologetics so we might be equipped and ready to defend our faith whenever someone might ask for why we have hope and faith in Jesus Christ. So number one, be prepared by knowing your context. Remember earlier in uh, Acts 17, when I read verse 16 to you and I asked you to uh, store what was going on there in the back of your mind. Let me read that to you again. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. I find that fascinating, right? Here Paul is this learned, educated, Jewish, Roman citizen (laughs) who is fully aware of both the God of the Bible, but also the beliefs of many Roman citizens. And it says that as he walks through Athens, he's provoked by the city's idols. Here's the question I want to ask you and have you think through this morning. What are the idols of our time? What is What are the things that people tend to run after and worship in our time? It may not be Poseidon. It may not be Zeus or it may not be one of the other Greek or Roman gods, but what are the idols of our time? Maybe money, maybe fame, education, power. What do we notice when we see people stuck pursuing these idols and how do we respond to them? I think far too often we are not provoked by the idols of our day. Instead, we allow them to exist amongst us and sometimes we might even worship them alongside our unbelieving friends and neighbors. That idea of being provoked there is that Paul was actually heartbroken over the fact that people were being turned away from the living God to worship these things. And we subsequently should be able to identify these idols in our own culture and context and be heartbroken over them. And in that heartbreak, we should desire to engage our neighbors, to engage our one with the truth of how Jesus is better than the idol that they worship or serve. The second thing we see Paul do is that he finds common ground with the Greeks around him. Look at what he says in verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way You are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. He points out the common ground that they both start from, and that's this both the Epicureans, the Greeks, the Stoics, anyone that might worship any of the gods on the hill there in Athens, come with the same desire to seek truth and know God. See, here's something that's true about the entire human race. God created us for worship, meaning that all human beings are worshiping something. The question just is what? Paul 
shares this later on in Romans chapter 1, verse 25, when he's giving a defense of why all men and women are without an excuse for not worshiping God. Look at what he says. He says, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. Right, the point that Paul is making there in Romans chapter 1 is that all human beings worship. The main problem that the human race has is that we've chosen to worship creation or created beings rather than the creator of those things. That we worship love and subsequently we end up worshiping a certain person instead of worshiping the creator of that person or the creator of love. That we worship our own physique, our own self, a created being instead of the creator himself. But Paul is showing us here in Acts 17 that we can still find common ground even with someone who does not believe in God the same way that we do. And that in seeking truth and answers, we can find common ground and use that as a unifying distinctive amongst us. Even in the strangest worldviews and religions, we can often find some common ground. C.S. Lewis put it this way in Mere Christianity. I have been asked to tell you what Christians believe, and I'm going to begin by telling you one thing that Christians do not need to believe. If you are a Christian, you do not have to believe that all the other religions are simply wrong all through. If you are an atheist, you do have to believe that the main point in all religions of the whole world is simply one huge mistake. If you are a Christian you are free to think that all these religions, even the queerest ones, contain at least some hint of the truth. When I was an atheist, I had to try to persuade myself that most of the human race have always been wrong about the question that mattered to them most. When I became a Christian, I was able to take a more liberal view. But, of course, Being a Christian does not mean thinking that where Christianity differs from other religions, Christianity is right and they are wrong. As in arithmetic, there is only one right answer to a sum, and all other answers are wrong. But some of the wrong answers are much nearer being right than others. The first big division of humanity is into the majority, who believe in some kind of God or gods, and the minority who do not. On this point, Christianity lines up with the majority. It lines up with ancient Greeks and Romans, modern savages, Stoics, Platonists, Hindus, Mohammedans, etc. against the modern Western European materialist. Paul encourages us the way that C.S. Lewis does, that we can seek to find common ground with those who might not believe in God, so as to build a common goal. And in that common goal, you are able to reach them, showing we're seeking the same thing. I just believe the thing that I'm seeking is fully revealed in the God of the Bible. The third thing we see Paul do is this. He exposes the deficiencies in in false worldviews and philosophies. I think it is important that whenever we are discussing or defending the gospel, that we must first expose the failure in the opposing worldview or belief. And I actually believe that there can be a simple way to do that. I think one of the most simple ways that we can engage people of other worldviews and beliefs is ask them to flesh out the logical conclusions of their belief system and then ask them this question. How is it working for you? You fleshed out your worldview. You fleshed out what you believe to be true about human beings and the human race and maybe God or the lack there of a God. How is that working out for you? Let me give you some examples of this. Right, We are littered now with what I would call in our modern day, the worldview of what's known as naturalism, that All that exists is what we can actually see, and there's no such thing as a metaphysical. God isn't necessary. All we have is the natural world. Well, how does that work out? Maybe some questions to consider asking a naturalist is, where did everything come from in the first place? What started all this? Is it possible to get organic from inorganic? Is it possible to get intelligence from unintelligence? 
Naturalism often struggles to ask basic questions. From my understanding, most of the scientific community would say that the world and our universe had a finite starting point. And they would hold to theories such as the law of sec- the th- second law of thermodynamics, meaning everything is moving from order to disorder. And that heat is escaping <laughs> and becoming less ordered. Well, that means that there was then a starting point that also seems to then go against some of our other scientific discoveries and ideas. Meaning, can naturalism answer the question of how the universe started in the first place? Another common worldview and theory out there is universalism, that all worldview, religions, and philosophies are true and the same. Maybe you can begin by asking this question. How do you know that to be true? How do you know that it is absolutely true that everything is true. And if that is absolutely true, what about worldviews and religions and beliefs that say they are the only one and that your worldview and belief system is wrong? See, that worldview fails to pass what philosophers call the law of non-contradiction. When two opposing things are put up against one another and both simultaneously claim to be true, they cannot both be true if they are not in agreement with one another. Maybe here's another one. All morality is relative, and we shouldn't judge people because morals are simply a construct of the society that we grew up in and what we have experienced. And so then that begs us to ask the question, are all moral choices equally right or equally wrong? Maybe to put it another way, what about racism? Is racism okay? Because all moral choices are equal. What about those that might hold to eugenics and believe that there are certain people and races and and those that might have physical deformities and disabilities? Eugenics would say that they are unworthy of life and they are a drain on society and we should eliminate them. As a moral choice, is that one okay? Ask that question and see what their response might be. The fourth one I want to share is this, and this is common in our context in Gainesville. What I see forming is the worldview or the religion of activism, (laughs) that there is some social cause or idea that they want to get behind, whether it be uh, providing water to places that don't have it, or fixing systemic racism and oppression, or fixing government, that they believe if we are just active in changing people's minds in this one particular area, we will make the world a better place. And I would ask this question, can we actually cure all social ills without the gospel and without God? Have governments demonstrated over time that they are successful institutions to cure evil and sinfulness? Notice how In most of these examples that I've given, I didn't even attempt to give a rebuttal most of the time. I simply just asked questions. Because it is my belief that most worldviews and systems crumble under the weight of objective truth and reality around us when they are presented with their logical ends and means. And therefore, Paul shows us here in Acts chapter 17 that we can engage other people and their worldviews simply by asking questions. And when their statements do not line up with objective reality, we can then begin to challenge them and say, this is why I do not follow your worldview. Admittedly, this takes studying. This takes talking to people. And this takes maybe even sometimes admitting when you might not know a topic well enough to discuss it. But we could then do the research so that we're ready to engage those around us and like Paul, expose the deficiencies in false worldviews and philosophies. The last thing we see Paul do is this. He declares the greatness of his God over all things. He says, God is greater than your idols. He's greater than Athena. He's greater than Poseidon. He's greater than Zeus. He's greater than Artemis. God is greater. 
And Paul displays this by showing them how God is actually better than their idols. He says, look, God is not only more powerful than your idols, but he's also not far off and he is knowable. This this means that God is bigger than anything that the Greeks could possibly imagine and yet reveals himself to them as their God. This means when we get to difficult questions about God, like the Trinity, we can take a step back and say, you know what? This is good. God is bigger than me, and yet he's still revealing himself to me so I might know him. I want a God who's smarter than me, more powerful than me, and more all-knowing than me. I want God to be bigger than me (laughs) because that is a God that is worthy of my worship. And that is exactly what Paul outlines here to the Stoics and the Epicureans. And as Paul does this, we get to see his response here or the response of those around him in Acts 17, starting in verse 32. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, which I find fascinating because that is actually um, a mythological name of a god, (laughs) the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So here's what we can expect when we're going to defend the faith. Some will mock, some will want to hear more, and some will join and believe. So here's the question I want to pose you with this morning. Where are you in being able to defend the faith? If you're a Christian listening this morning, God has empowered us as the body of Christ to be able to defend the gospel. We can be empowered by the Holy Spirit, trained by his word, trained by the church so that we can defend our faith to those around us the way that Paul does. That we can give a defense of the gospel to our one, to our neighbor, to our coworker, to our family members that we can share the good news of what Jesus has done. And it's logical, it's reasonable, and it's defendable. If you're listening this morning because you don't have anything better to do in this season of the coronavirus, or a friend of yours who's a Christian asked you to listen this morning, first and foremost, thank you for listening. And let me just say this to you. The God of the Bible answers all of life's questions. I have studied countless world religions and philosophies. Of all of the world religions, only the Bible, in my opinion, gives the most sufficient answers to basic questions like, why are we here? Why is there evil? Why is there a moral standard? Ask your Christian friend those questions. The Bible is able to stand up to those questions and critiques and answer them. And here's what I would say to you. The all-powerful creator of our universe wants to know you. He created you to worship him and to know him and to enjoy him. And yet there is a problem. You just like every other human being, including myself, have rejected God's rule and reign and authority and have sinned and rebelled against him. But God in his mercy and his love sent his only son, that's who Paul talks about there towards the end of Acts chapter 17, sent his only son, Jesus Christ. Jesus lived a perfect life. And at the end of that life, he was wrongly accused and arrested, and ultimately sent to the cross and crucified for our sins in our place. And in that, 
he gives us his righteousness. And if we simply repent of our rebellion and trust that Jesus lived and died for us and rose again from the dead, God offers us forgiveness and new life in Christ and adopts us into his family. He is the solution. You are presented with an option this morning. You are presented with the option and the opportunity to either respond to what God says to be true in the Bible or not. I pray that you would take that seriously. And if you don't already, if you haven't already responded to Jesus, that you would do so or ask someone in your life who knows him to tell you more. Thank you for joining us this morning. A testimony to God's faithfulness to his mission, which is to see the God in the likeness of his death and raise to walk in newness of life.